Separating the art from the artist. <sighs> this is quite the difficult subject to tackle. So if you're watching this video, I'm under the assumption that you've at least encountered this concept in one way or another. You might be super familiar with it, you might be a little familiar with it, you might have seen people talking about it, but either way, I'm going to give my definition of what separating the art from the artist means to me so we have a boilerplate to work off of. In the simplest of terms, being able to separate the art from the artist is basically viewing, enjoying, consuming any art without thinking about the person slash people behind the creation of it. And that's it. That's all that means. But with that comes an iceberg's worth of discussion, and really, this could justify a college course on its own. Two interesting little tidbits that I found when researching for this video. One, this is a concept that has existed for a long time. In my mind, I always thought this was something that was birthed from the internet age. Now that I looked it up, it makes sense, but I always assumed this was a more recent phenomenon. And then two, the concept of separating the art from the artist doesn't just apply to a negative connotation. Originally, it was applied more in a neutral sense to make art more objective. And for the purposes of this video, we're just going to be talking how it applies to music and musicians because, well, one, this is a music channel. Second, music is in a very precarious position when it comes to the scope of this discussion. Let's take the production behind a film. 98% of movies made, even with the smallest of budgets, the most indie film projects that, that even want to get see seen by anybody, have at minimum a, a crew of at least 20 people. A, a crew of at least 20 people who are contributing to the final product in a creative way. Whether it be actors, cinematographers, set designers, uh, costume designers. And then on the other side of that, you have uh, a single piece of visual art, such as a painting where more or less it's just from the mind of one person. Music's kind of in this middle ground because with the recording technology that we're afforded these days, one person can conceivably write, produce, engineer, uh, mix, release a, a full length album. Flip side of that, you can have an album like Michael Jackson's Thriller or Olivia Rodrigo's Sour, who conceivably have a crew of about 20 people behind the production of that album. And that's not even counting label heads and people behind the art direction of those albums, as well as Taylor Swift and Haley Williams in Olivia Rodrigo's case, since she did interpolate their music. So let's take somebody problematic in the film industry, let's say Woody Allen. A lot of film buffs don't have much reservations about watching his films, even knowing what we know now about some of the pretty messed up things he did. Because even though Woody Allen wrote these films, he directed these films, he starred in these films, there's still a full company of people uh, that influence that had a hand in the production and release of his films. Music is a bit different because from what I've seen, the captain has a tendency to go down with their ship. Or should I say, the ship has a tendency to go down with its captain. Okay, so what's my what's my TLDR? What are what are my two cents? What what is my answer to the question? can you separate the art from the artist? My answer is that it's 100% up to you. This may seem a little bit like a cop-out answer, and I understand that, but it warrants an explanation. First off, and this might be a controversial opinion number one, but I am of the belief that you shouldn't be under any external pressure to not listen to a certain artist for something that they did. And the reason is, one of the biggest arguments for making somebody feel bad or guilty for listening to a certain artist who did something awful is that you're monetarily supporting them, that you're, you're voting with your wallet, you're speaking with your wallet. And look, we've all seen Spotify's revenue model. The way artists are compensated for streaming numbers is absolutely embarrassing, we all know this. But in a kind of sick and twisted way, it sort of empowers us as listeners. And if there's an openly problematic artist that exists and you're going to all their shows and you're buying all their merch, then that's a different story. But I firmly believe that your 50, 100, even 200 streams of a certain artist isn't making much of a difference in their bank account. Now, with all that said, it is up to you. <clears throat> what are your beliefs? What shakes you the most? What line is too far? And I'm not trying to say that one heinous act is, is worse or better than another heinous act. But you know what you believe in. You know where you draw the line. And, <laughs> and 
You also know your music taste. You know what you listen to and what you like. And as we'll see, there are so many cases where modifications to the rules do have to exist. One rule that you have for not being able to separate the art from one artist might not apply to another. So me, for example, if you'd um, allow me to talk about myself for a second, is that I don't take much stock in two words. If an artist that I really like says something that I highly disagree with or goes against my beliefs, I, I'm able to look past that. Now, if what they're saying is more of a symptom of a more underlying issue that they have, then I'll reevaluate it. But if it's just like a one-off comment or it's something that may have been misinterpreted, I, I can look past it. I take more stock into how they actively hold themselves. So if, you, if you'd allow me to talk about myself for just a little bit longer, I'm gonna give three examples of times I've had to deal with separating the art from the artist. <laughs> So in the wake of the Astroworld tragedy, in which nine people died, Travis Scott pretty much made it clear that he does not care about his fans at all. He doesn't care about the safety of his fans. And look, I understand, once you reach that level of popularity, it's hard to see your fans as anything other than this uh, singular blob of people. It's hard for you to see your fans as individuals. And I get that. I'm not expecting Travis Scott to send me a birthday card every year, even though that would make for a pretty fun birthday story. But the fact is, his apology came off as so insincere. This happened at a festival that he's pretty much the public architect of, and it also happened during his set. And there's a debate, you know, did he know, did he not know, uh, did he know the extent to which casualties were happening? And look, I'm sorry, he knew. He had every chance to stop the show. But it's clear that he cares more about himself than the safety of his fans. This was a hard pill to swallow because I consider myself a pretty moderate fan of Travis's. I liked Rodeo, Antidote was like my 2016 summer jam. I loved Astro World. I liked the singles that he released leading up to the tragedy. And I can't listen to Travis Scott's music right now because every time I hear it, I just hear an asshole. And I understand that a lot of the musicians I like are most likely assholes, especially ones at that level of popularity. You can't not get an ego about it. I mean, I listen to Kanye West and he clearly only cares about himself, but at least nine people aren't dead as a result of his ego. And to reiterate, if his music is that essential to you and you're able to accept that, I'm not gonna say look past, but you're able to accept that, that is totally fine. That is totally your prerogative. You don't deserve a medal. I don't think anybody should make you feel bad for listening to his music. It's just your personal preference. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar, uh, Brand New is like a mid-2000s like emo revival band. Um, their music's all right, I guess. <laughs> In 2017, it came out, and it was pretty much confirmed by everybody that Jesse Lacey uh, basically groomed an underage girl. For me, I was never a really big fan of Brand New in the first place, so the choice was easy. I wasn't willing to bear the emotional weight to listen to music I was already lukewarm on. But I think a lot of brand new fans were especially shell-shocked with this news because of the way that Jesse Lacey built up his character. He came across as this very quiet and fragile and introspective songwriter. It would be one thing if they wrote about, I don't know, like fantasy concepts and Lord of the Rings and elves. The fact is, their music laid an emotional foundation for their listeners by helping them cope with trauma caused by issues such as parasitic relationships and childhood abuse. To find out that the person who wrote those lyrics is a predator turns them on their head as now they're coming for the perspective of someone who caused those issues. And this is where the subject gets complicated because the context of the art itself plays a really big role in how much we can stomach the actions of the people behind the creation of it. I know it might be kind of silly to refer to this person as an artist, but I think a lot of people experience the same phenomena 
when it came out that Ellen DeGeneres basically facilitated and encouraged a toxic workplace on her show because she sort of developed this bulletproof image of herself as this happy and positive and keep calm and move on type of persona. Now, let's say that story came out about somebody like Howard Stern it wouldn't really have as much of an effect on his fans. For as much as we want to view the art independently of the person behind it, sometimes the person puts so much of themselves into it that we really can't unsee them. But I'll get into that later, maybe. I hope this doesn't uh, get me in trouble, but I think everything that I've established so far and how I view this topic. I don't think I'm being hypocritical at all. I think I've established a pretty straight uh, and consistent narrative, but just be warned, it's not something I'm proud of. I'll just I'll just put it like that. This is a band which, you know, based off of Spotify streaming numbers, uh, a lot of you probably aren't super familiar with. If you want to find out more behind the full story and how these events unfolded uh, surrounding the whole jank controversy, I recommend checking out this video by Nate the Mate. But in essence, uh, Jank was a three-piece, actually an emo revival band uh, that pretty much existed in the years 2015 to 2016, roughly. And their star pretty much burned out as quickly as it rose because it came out that their singer, Lou Diamond, uh, was accused of sexually assaulting a minor. This isn't to confirm nor deny uh, the contents of these allegations. I'm not here to come up with any sort of definite conclusion, but for me, I like to have a reasonable doubt on both sides. I don't want to assume that they're true. I don't want to assume that they're not true. But from the information given and just the way it all unfolded, it probably happened. It probably happened. With all that being said, I still listen to Jank. Now that's not to say that I'm proud of it, because I'm not. But for me, as a music listener, as, as solely a music listener, their music feels so essential to me. And I don't listen to it for the lyrical contents. There's some interesting songs from a lyric perspective, but I'm mostly listening to it because I love the music and there's a specific itch that jank scratches that i just can't find anywhere else and i'm not listening to their music because i support sexual assault you know nobody's listening to brand new because they support sexual misconduct and nobody's listening to travis scott because they support people who really should be tried for manslaughter if we're being honest here and this is where the line gets kind of janky I only listen to them on streaming. If Lou Diamond came out and said, we're reforming Jank and we're touring and we're coming to your town, I would not go to that show. There are some people out there who are going to see the fact that I, I listen to a band and think that in some ways it means that I support uh, something as sinister, as awful as sexual assault. and. That's just not true. And that's putting out a false narrative about somebody. And that's why you're given the power to listen to what you want to, independent of the person slash people behind the creation of it. If an artist's actions or who they are as people um, bother you uh, to a point where the music that they make doesn't really justify you wanting to listen to it, then that's totally fine. If you stand no ground and it just doesn't matter and you're able to separate the art from the artist completely, even if the artist is so ingrained in the music itself, that's also fine too. These are all totally fine lines of thinking. So I do want to briefly touch upon uh, the inverse of the negative connotation for separating the art from the artist. And what I mean by that is there are times, I believe, where we are more drawn to a piece of art. We are more drawn to a song or an album because of the story behind it, because of the people making it. So the biggest example I can think of off the top of my head is Daniel Johnston. And this is in no way to disparage his music. This is in no way to disrespect it in any way or call it bad. So basically, Daniel Johnston was an outsider musician who was born um, some town in Texas, I can't think of it right now, who 
suffered from pretty severe mental illness uh, and childhood abuse. Again, if you want to find out more about Dan Johnson, there's so many great documentaries, so many great videos and books written about the man. But I think a big reason a lot of us are drawn to his music is because of his story and where he came from, where his music is really just an extension of him. And I believe, and I, this might be, this is controversial take number four at this point, but if he was just some normal kid from Pasadena, California, I don't think as many of us would be drawn to his music. That being said, if he was a normal kid from Pasadena, California, he probably isn't making that kind of music, but I do believe the backstory is so tied up to the music itself. So as we wrap up, I want to show you guys a little graph that I made. Now, if you graduate high school, you recognize this as your simple four quadrant graph arranged by an X and Y axis. Now, if you didn't graduate high school, you probably recognize this as a uh, political compass chart. So as you see, the X axis is how much you like a band. Now note, if, if it's below zero, if it's in quadrants two or three, it doesn't mean that you hate the band or that like you actively despise them it just means you wouldn't consider yourself a fan so maybe like a couple songs or you know you you like them on a very very casual basis and on the y-axis is where they rank morally so quadrant one is pretty simple you like them they're good people there's really nothing complicated about that uh, quadrant two you know they're good people you don't like them as much again nothing nothing too crazy here now quadrants three and four is where this gets a little bit interesting. So quadrant three is, you know, you're not a fan of them. You maybe like a couple songs, maybe you had an album on repeat like 10 years ago. But if, if you saw that they were coming to town, you wouldn't really jump out of your seat to see them. But in addition to that, they kind of suck as people. And then quadrant four is where it gets really complicated because you are a fan of this band. You would jump out of your seat to see them. So the next thing to do with this graph is to draw a line. It can be 180 degrees. Uh, it can be uh, positive linear, which would be kind of weird, but um, maybe it's if you're a conservative or something and you just listen to music because it's problematic. Or it could be negative linear, which is where I sit. And I would assume a lot of, a lot of you would sit there but we don't know. I quickly want to plot where the three artists that I talk about sit on my spectrum. So this is where my line sits. It's not an exact science, but it gives a pretty good indication of where I'm willing to go. First is Travis Scott, who barely falls under the line. You know, I consider myself a fan, but I think a person with the ego the size of Pluto, who really should be tried at the very least of manslaughter, um, I think that's pretty dang bad and he, he falls under it and it's at the point where I feel okay emotionally divorcing myself from his music. Then we have Brand New who, easy choice, not a huge fan, not worth it to listen to the musings of a predator. But then where it gets complicated is with Jank who as you can see is lower than Brand New because I think sexual assault is terrible. <laughs> it's like a really bad thing to do but because I... I'm such a big fan of the music, of the music itself, I'm willing to emotionally divorce myself from the actions of the singer. You know, I'm willing to accept the fact that I'm listening to a person who committed a absolutely vile, terrible act because it's just a testament to how much I like the music. It doesn't mean that, like, it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't think this person should be in jail. It's not that I'm saying that I'm supporting who they are as a person. I just like the music that much. And that's the video. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed watching it as much as I didn't enjoy making it. There's a lot of uncomfortable discussions to be had. And honestly, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of it. So I would love to hear y'all's thoughts and opinions on the matter. Um, please, before you do, check the description. Uh, I definitely added some clarifications and follow-ups just because I know I probably didn't express my point to the best of my abilities. But super looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. As always, please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you all next time.